Hello and welcome to another project by the Mail and Guardian. This time we have partnered with Gahiso Trust. My name is Lise Gatandwa and I'm the political editor at the Mail and Guardian. We have a strong panel of activists and leaders in their own right who will share their views around youth and uh, voter participation. With us is Kumo Kumalo, who is the founder of uh, 94 Was Misunderstood, a letter engaging the South African political and uh, the South African politics and identity. We also have Otsi Ile Ngadimeng, who is the executive director of a youth voting advocacy group called So We Vote. We have Obageng Khadze, who is the Youth Activist Program Manager at the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation. And of course, we needed to have someone with institutional memory, someone who will take us back to the times, the dynamic times of, of youth participation that led us to the liberation of this country. And he is the trustee of Kakiso Trust, Tatu Zoe Tao Nevutalo. He is also a, a former superintendent general uh, that, that I think I've butchered your name. <laughs> you you let me know. But he is the former superintendent general uh, in the Limpopo Provincial Department of Education. He was involved in CODESA, the Development Trust, uh, the Transitional National Development Trust, and Mulweni Council Center. So thank you so much to everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to take and uh, take from and understand the youth currently as it stands. We are nine days away from the elections, Dada. Why was this so important for uh, Gahiso Trust? Why this discussion? Because the trust um, <clears throat> was really uh, founded um, during the struggle for democracy. And we have seen with our own eyes what was our wildest dreams when in 1994, uh, after the struggle, we could vote. 1994, I voted for the first time when I was 34 years old. My mother almost cried when she voted. In fact, she passed on in 1994. She was always crying just for that moment to make a determination on who governs this country. Uh, you will remember that during that time, we were not allowed to vote. But we had people in parliament who were representing us, having been voted only by white people. You know, it was so funny. So uh, just to come to your point, uh, having struggled, we have seen something developing in this country. The, when we moved to 1994, the cues, the passion, especially of young people, do you know that young people were all over in 1994? They were in villages, they were in farms, educating the elderly, uh, urging them to come out in their numbers to go and vote, and they did come out. But you have seen that during successive elections, we have seen uh, the absence of young people. And I think, it's a very painful issue that we watch because we have to hand over this country to young people. Young people, uh, it is their future. This country is their future. And if they are not actively participating on who governs them, the institutions of government, then I think it does not augur well for our country. That's why Kakiso Trust said we, you see on the board, we, of Kakiso Trust. Members who sit there now uh, actually are members of different political parties. I need to say that. So, but we have agreed. We agree on something. Even though we differ in terms of which political party we support, we agree that democracy is sacrosanct. It is so important. It is the best way of uh, 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 ending up any political contestation as to who leads the country, 
not only the best way, the peaceful way, and that is why we are going all out as Kakiso Trust with the legal resources that we've got to try and make sure that we encourage people to go and vote on the 29th of May. And not only people, but we are focusing also particularly on the young people. We are really praying and longing for those long queues of 1994, if possible, even longer than 1994. Um, Obakeng, you're looking at less than 20% of South Africans age 18 and 19 years and only 40% of 20 to 29 years of age have registered to vote. Given what Utata has said about the history of this country and the importance of youth participation that led us to 1994, why have we seen a decline? Um, so we've seen a decline, and I think I'm seeing this from engagements that we have with young people from the Ahmed Kafrada Foundation. So we go into different communities and we have civic education workshops. Um, we have sessions with undecided voters and so forth. And these are young people in particular. This decline is not because young people are not interested in voting or do not understand the politics of this country. This decline is that young people do not see anything that aligns with them and their needs. So you will go and talk to young people about, but why are you not voting? And they say, I understand the importance of going there, and I really do wish there was something to go there for. So we find ourselves at a time where we were even having a conversation earlier about how political parties are not just talking to people. You're not telling people what is it that you can do for them, so why would I even um, waste my time and go try and vote? So those are conversations that we pick up from young people that nothing aligns with my needs, nothing speaks to me all I hear is political politicians squabbling and fighting each other and saying this one did that a plain game that does not involve how my life will be improved so I think at the core of it is that young people are not disengaged from the politics they understand that politics are personal but they just do not find anything that aligns with them Whose fault is that, Kumo, when, when you're looking at it? Um, and, and she makes valid, pertinent points because when you look at um, manifestos, um, yes, there is a, a role. They do understand that there's a role that young people need to play in terms of feathering our economy. And we do have a huge uh, amount of young people who are unemployed, a huge amount of young people who know that when they get to university, after that, after the fact, they'll go back to home. Whose fault is that uh, that voter participation is it uh, has declined is it the political parties is it the agencies the institutions that should be mobilizing or is it the youth um i think to a large extent it's the political parties right because democracy to some extent is about representation and if people are saying that they're not willing to engage with their democracy it means they're not necessarily happy right so if we've got young people saying that their needs aren't necessarily being prioritized we've got young people who are saying that look i need a job now and there isn't necessarily a solution for me that implies that politics has failed the people right in all capacities because it's not like the anc has just been the sole majority the anc has been the majority with other opposition parties right um, and we need to ask ourselves, where are those oppositions playing hands in? Where are those oppositions actually advocating for us as the youth? Are they bringing us in? Are they bringing our voices in? Because I think uniquely what we're going to see is that with an ANC, with a DA and with an EFF, we've all kind of had a share um, in the elections outside of the EFF, which is still relatively new. Um, they haven't engaged young people. That's the truth of the matter. And they still fail to engage young people. And if they continue to do so, it either means young people have to charter their their own path or secondly young people are going to have to decide who really needs to lead them we're seeing the uh, emergence of new parties such as rise and zanzi such as build one south africa which tend to put the priority in the youth but still there's an element and there's a feeling that we're not actually getting the needs and priorities to the forefront and even though we're being spoken about in alongside with other policies such as nhi and other things when people need basic education when people need basic human rights what you need to tell people is how you're going to improve their now their livelihoods and their standard and until we do that for young people i don't necessarily think there's an expectation for us for them to go to the voting polls if they don't have necessarily people to represent them but I do think there is something to say is if you're disgruntled with your government now you have to find a solution to that don't sit back and do nothing what are the in, uh, intrinsic needs of, of young people um, what do young people want to hear from politicians they want solid plans on how they're gonna get jobs 
how this economy is going to create not only an environment of growth, but an environment of prosperity. Because we can have fruitless growth, which is what a lot of people would reference the last 30 years as, you know. How many people have come out of poverty? Is it significant enough for us to say that South Africa has succeeded in that respect? So young people not only want to hear that you're committed to that, but they want to see it in your planning and they want to see it in detailed planning. You know, one of the work that we do, at, some of the work we do at So We Vote is we break down manifestos because manifestos, yes, they are there and they're there to tell people what people want to do in government, but they're not written at a level where normal people can say on day one of governing, this is what you're going to do when this issue arises on your desk. So young people are frustrated by that, but they want to see growth in the economy. They want to see jobs. They want to see healthcare because I mean, the cost of healthcare in this country is unacceptable. Uh, they want to see an environment where South African society can prosper because I think it is a sense. I, I don't think I can put into words, but it's a feeling that the majority of young people have in this country, that there is something deeply flawed with the South African, that the, that the South African nation, that the country, that we feel as though we're on a knife's edge, we're holding our breaths, things feel like they're on fire. And it's not just a thing of the economy, it's a thing of our relations as South Africans, it's a thing of our place in this country. So they also want people that can give them a sense of our future is going to be brighter than our past. Have have that we have the political parties failed on this regard? Having read their manifestos, having uh, listened to what they say when in relation to the youth, have they failed in this regard? Why do young people relegate such an important right? There is nothing called political parties are human beings. When we go to vote, we have the same rights, all of us, to uh, make a determination on our future. We were very dissatisfied with the apartheid system, but our vote was not materialistic. We were not saying we vote because, of course, people did sell issues of houses and so on. The biggest thing was self-reliance. We are now going to build this country ourselves. It was about our own dignity being restored when we went out there to vote. That was how young people felt about it. Uh, you could say we were we were we were real citizens of this country and the, the very uh, you express that by actually casting a vote uh, the material st things comes much later the problem with our democracy now and that is a problem with young people they are now relegating a very sacrosanct position of them to determine the future of this country to material things they must sort out those material things. And the first way of sorting out those material things is to participate in the elections, to hold whoever is voted accountable. They will never change anything by sitting at home and opting out of the system. You can't change anything. And I think uh, we must go beyond political parties when it comes to this. And that is a problem. It is too toxic, materialistic. And the moment you do that, you actually lose everything. Someone says, no, I can't vote because I don't have a house. I can't vote. I mean, my generation, where I can tell you that uh, there is no one in my generation that can stand up here and say democracy did not benefit us materially. But that was not what we were that was not the joy and the excitement that I was going to get a house. No, I mean, it was that kind of a right and dignity to say, I will now participate on who governs me. Institutions of government, I'm not going to be on the outside. I'm not a foreigner in this country. I'm part of this country and I'm going to take my place and be counted. And that is what is missing you know, for young people. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, our democracy has got a very wide range and we can see now 
you vote for any political party there. And now I'm talking, addressing the, the young youth as they are. You can vote for any political party there. And if you are unhappy with all of them, you start yours. So, <laughs> you know, you start yours. So where are the young people? We, that's not how we as young people fighting for apartheid were captivated on, you know, all these material things. We were saying we, we want to make a difference. We want to, for better, for worse, this is our country and we are going to make it work and we are going to, to determine our own future. that you have relegated your responsibility as, as young people. What do you say to this? I mean, he makes valid points, pertinent points, that in his time, the youth were active. In his time, the youth understood that they needed to be central to the change. What do you say to this? So I think a few things, right? And I think to speak directly to an article that I read after my month hiatus um, from writing newsletters, um, I speak specifically to something Nelson Mandela says where he says freedom is simply not enough. Freedom is to essentially derive dignity, to derive joy, and to derive value from society, right? And I think if we're sending the youth to go vote and they are not deriving those things, are they really free, right? We're a generation of born free. We're meant to see a prosperous world where we're integrated. We're meant to see a prosperous world where individuals have access to opportunity, individuals have access to jobs. And at the moment, we don't see that. So yes, are we relegating some of our rights and not engaging with our democracy? Yes, that can be true. I don't necessarily think I disagree with that sentiment. But I think when people in their generation are also saying that they're stepping away and not voting, when people who fought for the struggle are saying, I cannot vote for the ANC any longer, when ANC politicians are stepping away from the ANC and saying, I can no longer bear this campaign, it's a clear showing that people are giving up. It's a clear showing that people don't have faith in the system. And it's a clear showing that it's a sign for change. So yes, if it does mean that a few young people don't necessarily vote and that means they're relegating their rights they're saying something they're saying they're not happy with political parties and the democracy and we would very much love to be in politics but there's a 35 age limit that limits us from engaging with the political sphere so there's a lot of things where we understand how politics work we view it from the outside we're able to contribute all i can do is write and comment and say look nhi is a brilliant thing as a policy but actually doesn't lead to tangible change for the majority of people and we have to listen to our media is changing we can only comment we can only be the voices we can only share the stories as so we vote does but the people who make the change are the people who sit at the top and in reality we've tried to be in conversation with them we've protested we've fought right the youth has been impactful in South Africa for all of our history. 1976 was considered a turning point for when the world actually recognized apartheid. 2015, fees must fall. Once again, the world was put to light. We put a light on firstly one, a failing governance where they're, they're clearly individuals weren't getting education and academics. But secondly, we put into question what does it actually truly mean to be a South African in terms of so receiving social services and opportunity because individuals weren't receiving that. Fees must fall is almost a decade old, guys. Fees must fall is 10 years old. I mean, I was so young when fees must fall happened. I didn't know what was happening. I just was like, why is everyone angry and screaming and jumping and <laughs> dancing around? 19 years later, I've got friends, I've got family still fighting that exact same case, fighting that exact same problem. And mind you, the same oppositions who say they're going to change things, say they're going to argue for better policies, have been in parliament, have been sitting at those conversations. And yes, to some extent, we can say they're doing their job in terms of opposing them in court and so on and so forth. But I think there is an element to say that we are kind of restricted in the way in which we engage with our government and the way in which we engage with our political leaders. Because beyond Twitter, beyond Instagram, beyond the newsletters that we write, where do the youth actually have an opportunity to go to actually say this is where we should be heard and should be recognized and somebody will actually acknowledge our voice? Perhaps you can come in, uh, you know, as, as someone who has been in Uncle Kathy, we, we all affectionately call him Uncle Kathy because we know how much he, he loved the youth and, and he loved the passion of the youth. Um, do you share the same sentiments as Kumo that there aren't enough platforms where the youth uh, voice can be uh, shared specifically towards elections, specifically towards political parties, parliament and those change makers? So 
uh, right now it's elections and that's when everyone wants to hear a youth voice. That's why mm. uh, everyone is going to pretend that they care what young people think. That's when everyone is going to care that uh, pretend that they want to hear youth voices. But what's important is what happens after elections. So what's going to happen after the 29th of May? Are we going to see politicians going to different communities and saying they're having youth in Bezos? Are we going to see them going into schools and saying we want to talk to young people into institutions of higher learning? That's not going to happen. So young people are not sitting back because they are ignorant or because they do not care about the future of this country or do they do not feel the heat. Young people do not want to be taken for a ride. So do not come and knock at my door just because it's going to benefit you at that time. Why are you not having engagements with me during or after elections? Why are you not talking to me? Why are you not coming into my community? I, I always say this, right now it's very busy. You wake up today and you have individuals in your community who have now turned into uh, pick it up workers that do not get paid. They are cleaning up streets, they are doing all sorts of things. But they are not there after elections to engage you. So you need to wait for a whole five years to have someone to come and engage you. And I think just going to what Ntate was saying earlier, the struggles are different. So 1994, young people at the time wanted the right to vote. Young people at the time wanted to be treated equally in this country. Our struggle is much the same, but we also have a struggle of we want to be able to access higher education. We want to be able to be safe in our streets when we walk. We want to be able to have our voices heard, and that's what we, wa we are willing to fight for. But no one is willing to listen. So young people do not go there because no one is really listening and no one is going to engage me after this. They do not care. What do you think of... Um, uh, my concern is with um, these these sentiments that I shared is that we are noticing a democratic backsliding. Maybe you could uh, perhaps disagree with me, Otile. Um, how seriously should we take the problem in terms of the, the, uh, advancing our democracy uh, when the youth is not participating? Young people are invested in South Africa's democracy. To say that they're non-participants would be an abject lie. You go to the non-profit space, you go to the civil civic education space, you go to the civil society space. Who are the people leading protests? Who are the people at policy engagements? Mm -hmm. They're not the ones on the side of the implementation of the policy, but they're the ones that are there consistently saying this is what needs to change. So young people are there, and they're invested in democracy that way. But they're not going to vote for people who just come and show up and say, listen, I need your vote, and then never show up uh, after the elections, you know. Uh, they want to constantly feel valued. We, well, let me not say constantly, but consistently. The practice of keeping a democracy above float for a generation that isn't engaged politically involves political leaders understanding that the process as it currently operates in South Africa needs them to incorporate young people even greater into the way decision-making processes are made in this country. Climate change is by far one of the biggest issues that are going to impact my generation. But there's only two commissioners out of, I think it's 18 commissioners on the Presidential Climate Commission that are under the age of 45, actually under the age of 35. So where's youth representation there? Young people are tokenized in politics. Now, the backslide comes in in that if young people feel that, okay, I'm not valued, I can't participate because if I'm participating, I'm giving people who ignore me more power, more leverage, more control, then obviously... The, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. I can't talk when this thing is doing its nonsense. Can I start again? All right. Um, crisis of democracy. There is very much a crisis of democracy in the country. Obviously, when people are not voting, democracy seems to erode. Uh, it's pretty much a buy-in contract, you know. When people vote, they're opting into the system. They're opting into giving their support opting into giving it legitimacy, opting into letting that system govern them. But to say young people are not involved in democracy would be a lie. In the civic education space, in civil society, in all of these areas, young people are involved. They lead protests. You know, Kuma said fees must fall. Fees must fall was led by young people. But it wasn't just for education. They were working for people that were at universities who were older, the ages of their parents, who were struggling, who were being taken advantage of by the system. Young people have a profound sense of justice, but it feels as though in the South African landscape we live in today, though the constitution gives us that legal justice, there are people who live today in Soshanguve, 
in Tembisa, in Soweto, older people who live through apartheid, who sometimes say that they'd want to go back to the old system because they felt better taken care of. Now, is the backsliding democracy only in young people or is the backsliding democracy across the board? Because if older people, as Kumo said, are feeling that sentiment, then as Utata said, you know, the sentiment of freedom, what does it mean then to people? Because if you can ask someone who's been living in the same home since before apartheid was over, someone that was born just at the tail end of it, they'll tell you, we live in the rainbow nation, but that rainbow nation doesn't keep me fed at the end of the day. It, it, I, I, if I'm listening to this, I'm thinking uh, there is no hope for, for the South African youth. The South African youth is despondent. They don't feel like there is a, a, a way in which the current uh, um, uh, structure can benefit them. Am I right in thinking that? Maybe, maybe there's a problem. Mm. Let me come in here. Young people must understand this is their country. They don't need anybody's permission. You know, all of these young people that I'm sitting with here, they, it's like they are looking forward to some messiah to solve the problem of this country. Some, and that messiah is political parties or whatever. There are people who, I mean, it has never happened for the very first time People fought to change the system, to say you can't only have political parties. We must also have independence. This is what is, this is our country. This is the beauty of our country. It's not someone who sat back and just said, I am despondent with political parties. It's someone who says, we must lobby and fight to make sure that this democracy makes room also for independence. We cannot just be held ransom by political parties. The second issue is that uh, these young people are all agreed in the issues of, uh, I can say, material things, material benefits. My view is this, and I want to put it very clearly, uh, as in terms of my own generation. There is no way, no way that we can ever think of comparing where we are now, the west of where we are, and I understand that, with where we were during the apartheid system. There is no way. And secondly, I am very much convinced that had this country managed corruption, this country would, with all the economic constraints that we've got, would have been very far. So corruption is a big issue that actually came into our governance and issues. We do need leaders who have a commitment to serve their people. My problem is this, is that you see young people as corrupt, as us. Let me say as us, as their, as their, their predecessors. I mean, you hear of a university where the SRC is collecting bribes to make sure that people are admitted. So they are taking advantage of uh, the vulnerability of our own people now, young people. Now, that was very, very painful. Because during my time, young people were a light that was flashing and offering hope and showing, no, this is not the way we go. Remember, during the apartheid system, we have got so we had so many collaborators. I don't want to mention their names, you know, in the homeland system, and they were not young people. They were actually us, my generation. Uh, and, you know, people like that, uh, teachers and so on, they were collaborators. But young people broke through and says, no, 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 we have to confront the system. We must bring something. They did not only break through. They offered the alternative. In terms of leadership, they offered it. The problem is that young people must not, we must not mobilize young people, and I'm talking about young people, only during the voting process. Young people must be fully engaged in our democracy throughout. Build up to, to, to a voting process, during voting, and even post-voting. So all the structures of governance, young people must be there. 
and they must fight. And I want to conclude by saying they don't need anybody's permission. This is their country and their future. Perhaps, Kumo, we could talk about um, these alternative ways to mobilize the youth. Um, the rise of social media, we've seen the rise of social media, we've seen um, how the youth are more active in terms of um, pronouncing their own um, uh, uh, movements and uh, having a, a, a more radicalized way of, of looking at uh, democracy. Um, how can how is mobilization how is mobilization framed now in terms of the agencies that are responsible for mobilizing youth and how do we change that or make evolve that into a way where young people have a more interactive and direct way of having uh communicating with the agencies the npos but also being able to uh to communicate with political parties to in to ensure that they go to those voting lines so I think the first thing, um, which is probably just a clarity thing about like more Otsile and myself, um, is that we are like the people who try and progress those beliefs um, and viewpoints of voting, right? So what misunderstood something that I did on the podcast side was I engaged with student leaders of various ages, from VIT student SRCs to individuals who have com participated at JJC to individuals who have run private institutions as head of schools and we're engaging the youth. The issue is that we're just not being listened to, right? I, and I think it kind of materializes in how it comes up here, right? Um, I think it's important to separate materialistic things versus basic human rights, mm -hmm. right? There's an understanding that if I am not eating, regardless of how materialistic you think my meal is, I am not eating. Mm -hmm. If I'm not receiving an education, regardless of how materialistic you think my education is, because I think I should get a degree because I've gone through school and I've studied and I've passed the past few years, then that's not materialistic. That's your basic right. Mm -hmm. That's hard work. Those are the things guaranteed to you in the same constitution you voted for and you fought for back in 1994. And if we're hearing things about youth, and young people thinking that they should be deserving of certain things. Yes, I think to some element we can, we can engage the nuance to say there is some young people who think they should deserve everything, and we can engage that, and that's a debate in and of itself. But I think we can't be questioning human rights. We can't be asking ourselves about whether or not young people should be receiving a job or not. I think it should be expected of every government to provide everyone a job, irregardless of your age. This isn't about a thing about young or old. I mean... I come from a family where my literal grandparents, both of them, fought for liberation. Both of them ended up on Robben Island. And sadly, one of my, my grandfathers is late. And just a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with that same grandfather who's been to prison, who literally spoke about being in, being in detention, being in isolation. His words were, to me, I am not voting. A person who fought for liberation, a person who was left for dead, saying, I am not voting because I don't think I can engage with my democracy. That's a clear shine and that's a clear showing. And I think to then put it on the young people who weren't responsible in that same corrupt country, to put it on those same young people who weren't necessarily the individuals who said, let's keep the ANC in power, even though we saw them being corrupt for the last 30 years. We weren't old enough then. I could have told you the ANC was corrupt 10 years ago. That's not something that's new to us. So now that we're given the choice, we're given the ability to vote, of course we should go vote. But I'm afraid to say to any young person who doesn't have or doesn't know who they want to vote for, don't feel pressured to vote. And I think that's what's important to young people. We need to vote for people who represent us. And if that means that is no one, that is no one. We have to find better ways. The alternatives are through the people who get the opportunity to speak to the Mail and Guardian. The three of us are technically privileged individuals because we get to represent millions of South Africa. The fact that most South Africans don't get this opportunity to speak about their hardship, to speak about their struggle, to speak about the South African government that's continued to fail them. They don't get this opportunity and we do just because we put a few extra spare hours aside. I mean, it's of course more than that, but we put a few extra spare hours to just analyze the country that we live in. I think it's for shame. And I think it's for shame that we don't necessarily have people saying that, look, young people aren't being engaged with. 
if the statistic is 80, I mean, sorry, 60% of grade fours can't read for understanding, how do we expect them to read manifestos? Like, let's start thinking about the logic in terms of the things that we're writing so that it's actually leading to government and social improvement. Yes, it's our South Africa. Yes, it's our country. But when the people who are running it simply care to run it like a cartel and don't show the same pride and nationality that we do. I mean, we're the same young people who decided when we were writing exams to go watch a Springbok final. We're invested in South Africa. We're just not invested in a failing government. And I would refuse to stand here as a young person to stand for that. So if there is a young person who's out there, yes, to young people, let's go change South Africa. Let's go vote. But make sure you know who you're voting for. Make sure you know what you're voting for. Don't simply go vote and put an X next to a ballot or next to a party that's not the ANC because all the rhetoric has been anti-ANC. Go vote for your future. We're not looking for the Messiah. We're looking for policies that actually prioritize us. We're looking for manifestos that have step-by-step -step opportunities about how we're going to improve our livelihood because for far too long we've existed in promises, we've existed in policies, and we've existed in manifestos that simply haven't done enough for us. Oh, my God. Do you do you think when you look when you're looking at the uh, the role of the media uh, in terms of engaging with the youth in these particular elections, um, do you think that the media has fallen short, or do you think that the media has gone above and, and beyond its its work to ensure that it it you know uh, the youth voice is represented as much as the political parties and their manifestos and the rhetoric and the narratives that are being um, uh, thrown out. So I think there's much more that the media can do. Um, and also when we say media, we must look at who is who has access to that media and what is it saying and what's the language that's being used to communicate to young people. Um, what you see right now, left, right and center, is politicians doing this and that or they are arguing about that or, you know, but no one is saying to young people, like what Kuma is saying, which I think is very important. Everyone is just pushing a narrative that young people must go out and vote. But no one is having a conversation about know what you are voting for. No one is saying this is how to, to do the work that Utile and them are doing around, break down these manifestos for a young person to understand. So I'm definitely with Kumo on a point that don't feel the pressure of being pushed to go vote because it simply says your vote does not matter that much. We just want you to put the X and we have good numbers, but we don't really care what 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 you are voting for, what it means to you, right? So as much as it's important for young people to go out and vote, I think what the media should be doing also is how do we get a message across to young people to say this is what this uh, 300 page or whatever pages of a manifesto means when I break it down to you in 30 minutes or in 10 minutes. This is what it means and this is what it's promising to do for you, how it's promising to it do it for you. But right now what we see is who's campaigning more, who's got the money to pay for more ads or for more airtime on TV and all of that. And that's how we get to engage people, not just young people, but people in general. But no one is saying this is what they are promising and this is what how they are promising to deliver it. And I think that's where the media is really failing us in terms of get the message across, but get it clearly for an Obakeng in Soshanguze to understand it, a vet student to understand it, an academic to understand it. how do you balance that for people? Because then people rely on the media for information. But if the media is not also then coming to play to give us the information in the easiest language that anyone can understand, then there's really no use. Otile, I'm, I'm sure you'd like to come in there in, in, in terms of uh, uh, media's own responsibility uh, towards this particular election. What would you say um, where the media, I'm hoping you can say something <laughs> positive about the media. <laughs> But what would you say um, uh, is where the media needs to improve, if, ne if, if needs be? Well, obviously, I don't work within the media space. I just operate in the social media space. But I can say this. The discourse around politics in this country is just not made for people of a certain age. Mm. I mean, the DA, the ANC, the EFF, when they want to talk about their policy, they'll go on the SABC, ENC, Newsroom Africa. I don't know a single young person under 25 that owns a DSTV decoder. They need to... I wouldn't place all the blame on you guys. I mean, you guys are trying. <laughs> you're, you're, doing, you're doing a lot of good work. I mean, you, 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 yeah, you do a lot of good work. You cover these leaders when they go wrong. Half of the things we know that are wrong with this country, we know because the media is making us informed of that. So I would not place any major blame on you. Uh, but what I would say is that perhaps the challenge 
doesn't or the burden doesn't so much lie with you but more with the parties because ultimately when you're in a market and you're trying to sell your goods you don't put place the blame on the customer for not coming to you it's up to you to get your word out to the customer the media is not there to get politicians and their word out there the politicians it's their job to communicate their message to their constituents to the voters so i would say you're doing a stellar job uh keep it up keep holding them accountable but uh from our standpoint you know as we've identified it so we vote people don't have a problem with the media people have a problem with the parties they have a problem with the way the parties communicate they have a problem with the way the parties are inaccessible to them they have a problem with the way the parties use language that is totally uh delegitimate or disingenuous to their actual positions and so that's where the real challenge lies uh talk to me about and I'm I'm still I'm still with you um how South Africa's complexion would look like if we would have a much more active youth voice especially when it comes to uh elections hmm. <laughs> young people aren't a homogenous group so to to get a single voice that can speak to all of those issues would be very difficult you have different lived experiences that must be accounted for but i'd say that i think we'd be a country that is at least more at peace with itself a country that's able to buy in more to the system a country that feels more incentivized to look to the future i mean a lot of young people can't look to the future because they don't know what it looks like uh, the, the the nature of the decay and the maladministration we've witnessed is that typically your view of south africa in the future it's somewhere burning not good uh, not something you want to be a part of but i think that we'd see greater youth engagement i think when i say greater youth engagement i'm talking in leadership i think we'd then be able to mobilize a critical mass of young people to actually usher in a generational change in power in this country I mean I think it's often underlooked the fact that the generation that liberated us you know the great leaders the Nelson Mandela Walter Sisulu uh, Mamwini Mandela that generation was very clear they came in for a very short period of time to just usher the country into democracy then their proteges they handed over for our generation the complexities that the reason we're not getting that level of engagement within the political sphere is that these positions are being gatekept by ministers that were put in in the 90s but they're so comfortable in their chairs now they don't want to move and so that's a i mean it's the reality it's not even a controversial thing to say most young people know it no it's not uh that that is this unique to south africa the fact that the youth are not engaging i mean listening to owaging and kumo saying telling the youth that you don't necessarily if you, you don't necessarily have to feel the pressure to go and vote it's scary to think about it they make really good points that um the youth should not necessarily feel that they should vote for any political party because that political party is against the anc but is is this a phenomenon that is unique to south africa or are we seeing it globally uh the youth being really reluctant to go to the polls reluctant to engage in their political in the political atmosphere of their uh given countries no i think it's a global phenomenon in many respects and i don't think we are the west uh also just in terms of participating participation of the youth in uh, democratic institutions i mean uh, by the way if you look at even some very prosperous countries look at china uh, china has uh, attended to all those basic issues that you talk about jobs and so on but i can assure you that the young people are not there into that picture uh, tiananmen square is suppressed Uh, very much when they wanted to fight for their freedoms so the 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 material things they've been able to get there so but when it comes to if you go there and look at all those institutions and say where are the young people you will definitely be able to see that they are not there i think we 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 are converging in the sense that okay maybe the place where we differ i'm saying that young people must gear themselves to vote voting is participating in democracy and i'm saying that they must not start now during the voting process they must start in shaping who they want to vote for eh? so they mustn't think that someone is going to come from heaven 
that is going to be tailor-made for them. They must start in shaping. I mean, they just uh, indicated one of the weakness, that young people are not homogeneous. So they are divided themselves. <laughs> so they've got a big job throughout our democracy to strengthen what I can say, the youth voice, to be able to say, this is our non-negotiable as young people across the board. Uh, and so when they go to vote, uh, I fully agree with them. We Kahiso Trust has never advocated for voting cattle, as in, Manap in many other places. We're not saying vote for this party or just go and vote. No. Uh, go educate yourself about these manifestos. Vote for a party, maybe not a perfect, but the party that you think uh, closely reflect your own aspirations for where you want this country to go. Uh, but don't opt out. That's where we differ. You know, <laughs> I, they mustn't stay at home. Uh, please go and vote. And, and we're saying that the, it might not be the political parties that are there, including independents. They, they might not 100% fit your aspirations. But certainly, there must be some, uh, some light in one of them. So don't stay at home. Vote for one that you think approximates what your aspirations are. So don't. You can't get everything. Yeah, no, no, you can't. I mean, you have to work for it. Even when you work for it, we are not living in a perfect world. This is an imperfect world. Political parties are imperfect, but uh, 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 actually interrogate those manifestos and say, this one closely resembles what my aspirations for good governance is in the country. And please go out and vote for that one. That's what we say. Cool. Well, I'm going to come to you. I, I want you to, to please uh, just react to what Utata is saying, but also what are the key things that you are looking at for in those manifestos as the youth? Um, so I think firstly to the response of manifestos as a whole, um, also the youth not being homogenous, um, is firstly, I think we should all take our time to read those manifestos and recognize that there's very little differences between them, right? As in, you can read four different party manifestos and see the same policy with an edit here, there, and there. Manifestos aren't the truth. Manifestos aren't going to be the thing that carry us into the light. It's literally party infrastructure, how your party is managed, how your party is organized. And I think a lot of why we're discouraged right is we're seeing reoccurring politicians who have just left major parties right so when i think about the eff julius malema was part of the anc when we think about bossa um musi maimani was part of the da when we think about action sa herman mashaba was part of the da all we're seeing is politics essentially being broken down into smaller parties and us just being told to pick the worst of the best essentially <laughs> exactly it's a revolving door like um, other than rise, we're not really seeing any new political faces. We're seeing the same parties. We're seeing the same policies. So it's not like it's going. the change is going to come through reading manifestos. I've spent like literally the last two or three weeks just reading manifestos to understand what do I want to prioritize? What does the youth need? And I think it's very clear, right? I think as South Africa... We simply just need to get to a point where people can live freely again. Like we're at the point where people are having to live paycheck to paycheck. People don't necessarily know if there's going to be food at the end of the day. We've got students who have finished their degrees but haven't actually gotten a degree because NESFAS has failed to pay. Uniquely, what we're seeing is that we're seeing South Africans who are de being denied the ability to improve their own livelihood. I think all what the youth wants is the ability to have an opportunity to improve their livelihood if they so wish to do so. They want to have the education. They want to have the degree and they want to have the job opportunity to be there. They don't necessarily say, guarantee me the job, but they want to say, let me work through high school and through university and ensure that I'm on the dean's list and I ensure that I'm actually doing the best at university and actually I'm going to get my degree at the end of the day because that means I can actually get a job and I can help my mother who had to struggle for so many years. Uniquely we just want to change our situation as it exists in the now because what we're seeing is we're seeing students study in the dark. We're seeing universities having to cancel classes. People are losing out on their resources. People are losing out on their services and if you're in the top 1% that's great for you then you get to go to Cape Town and everything works perfectly but the majority of South Africans aren't there and for the majority of South Africans simply what they want to see is 
they want to see a change to their day to day, even if it means getting a job as a plumber, getting a job as an electrician. But what they want to see is a reprioritization of their people and actually see money come through the household because right now it's not. We're living on 350 grants. COVID showed us that this is just impractical and inhumane. And the fact that we still justify these systems and try to say people should live off these when clearly they failed time and time again shows like just a lack of understanding and a lack of engagement with the people, but also a lack of engagement with the youth. I mean, like I said, Fees Must Fall was 10 years ago, which means that you've gone through essentially two generations of undergrads and individuals are still saying they're not getting access to their education. Individuals are still not completing school and nothing has changed. Things have only worsened. Things have only gotten worse. Universities don't have power. We simply have an inability to live in South Africa, the South Africa we want to remain in, the South Africa we want to love. But at the moment, it's so dysfunctional. Living has become impractical. And simply all we want to see is a beautiful change to that living standard, food on the table, a job in the family. Those unique changes are the things that are going to give us hope, give us the ability to actually look to the future, to actually say, I want to be here in the next three or four years because at the moment we don't see past tomorrow. Tomorrow isn't promised in South Africa and that's the fear. Waking, is it is it not unfair to to place the blame uh, solely on the feet of government? Because um, essentially, what governments do, they they uh, lay a fertile ground for uh, business to thrive, and that's how employment uh, and that for and therefore employment is generated. Is it not unfair then to what Kumo is saying to lay it solely on the feet of government that his peers? Um, are <coughs> uh, living off of 350. Uh, his peers um, are unable to get work. Um, who's 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 to blame for that? And I is where does the private sector fit in in that? I think the reality is that the private sector has a huge role to play in the conditions that South Africans find themselves in. Um, we have people who are still fighting for minimum wages in the places that they work in, we, which is honestly also not enough for anyone to survive with, to raise a family, to you know pay the needs that they need to cover in their households. But I think what we also need to talk about is if we have a functioning government um, that is not captured in any way, then it would be easier for, pri for the private sector to also follow to and follow what the government says must be done. So there needs to be a balance in terms of how does government hold the private sector accountable, but how do we also as people hold the private sector accountable? So we know of businesses surrounding our communities that are ill-treating workers, that are not paying workers well, that are not hiring people from around those communities to benefit from those projects, um, despite how those projects are affecting the communities. So what do we do at a community level? How do you organize your community say, we know the company that's there and this is what they are doing. No one in this community works there, but it is affecting us. So how do we then go back and organize communities at a local level to say, you can also take some sort of action against that. Uh, but I think the reality is the private sector has been too relaxed and we have not had a conversation and I'm glad you asked that question about what is the role of the private sector in all of this and how do we hold them accountable too? Because they need to be held accountable also. So, uh, if you could just come in when it comes to uh, um, the private sector and 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 its role in terms of creating this viable uh, economy for the sorry creating this viable economy for the country and ensuring that uh, and having that responsibility to employ the youth uh, ever so often. I remember when I started, um, I needed experience and I was just straight out of university, but I still needed experience in order for me to uh, obtain a job. Why is it that there hasn't been that, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you as an elder, uh, as someone who was, who was active in forming this democracy, why is it that uh, the government of today has not put that much pressure in, in the private sector to ensure that youth employment becomes prime and becomes part of their uh, responsibility going forward. I went to a, a community event in the Northwest, uh, the Platinum Belt, and I listened as the private sector was giving us a report about how much wealth 
that platinum belt is uh, trillions of dollars. I ask them, if you, we are sitting on so much wealth and you are extracting that wealth, why is it that the people around here are so poor? They said to me, you must ask government. You must ask government. So we must understand that uh, we agree with some of the young people. The private sector is not government. Government is government. There are no two governments in a country. The, the whole framework uh, is really determined by those who govern. And uh, I think to a very even that environment for job creation, government can do a lot of it. But uh, in many other things, I think the government of the day let the private sector get off the hook. And maybe one of the reasons is that when we govern, uh, especially in South Africa, you cannot make a clear distinction about who is the private sector and who is government. Even government, people who are political leader, have got so many vested interests in the private sector. Now, that's a problem of the conflict of interest. And that's what young people are, should assist us. And there's no way they can cry a lot. But if people are sitting there in government and uh, they, they are supposed to hold the private sector uh, accountable and be the ones who determine legislation, regulations, and so on, but they also be on the other side. Be the, it's like, you know, when you expect a policeman to enforce traffic rules when he owns a taxi. He is sitting there and it is his taxi that stops there and the taxi is in bad shape, uh, putting people in great jeopardy. But it is owned by him. Is he going to write a ticket to himself? So I, I know I'm trading into difficult territory, but I agree with young people that uh, I think let's not waste our time about talking about the private sector. They have responsibility, but let's sort out government. I mean, you saw in my CV, I worked in the, in the DRC. And one of the things I saw, the moment I landed in the DRC, the infrastructure is broken, and then we were prepared to read how wealthy that country. The DRC is one of the most, the wealthiest country in the whole world, really, in the whole world. What is the problem? Is governance. They can't fix their governance. And uh, sometimes there's interference about pol political, colonial pa powers, political, so that they, do, they don't fix their governance because they know that once government is fixed, the people are going to benefit. It's going to be a very strong country. So they have problems with water. The Congo River has water to, we can all drink all over the, the Africa, but uh, they have got a problem with drinking water. They, Agriculture is broken. You can't even talk about the roads. I mean, I spent nine months there. And I think when we go to vote, and that's where we, as Kakiso Trasi, young people uh, participate in sorting the governance of this country. The other things will follow suit, I can tell you. They will follow suit. Once we get the governance right, a lot of things will come into place. So that's what we are saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I, I, I ask the final question, but uh, I'm going to ask you to just give me a little bit more time. We have five minutes. I'm going to ask for five more minutes. Um, Otsile, I wanted you to perhaps touch on this. You respond to that, but also perhaps touch on this. Um, I remember in uh, when I was what you deem the youth. I, I'm 37, so I'm no, no longer the youth. But what when I was still deemed the youth, as, as, uh, especially when I was starting out as an intern at the Herald, um, youth participation in political parties, the youth vibrant youth structures in political parties, DASO, the ANC Youth League, and um, and the Young Communist League. You know, you, you know, like Balintuli. You'll think of Julius Malema. Those were the products that came out of those structures, and slowly but surely, those structures fell apart. Uh, I don't think that any one of us know who, who the uh, leader of DASO is now. I don't think that anyone... Oh, you do? <laughs> 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 
So I'm going further. The the Young Communist League, for instance, not not everyone knows who the leader is there. Not everyone knows who Colin Malaji is of the ANC Youth League. Has that uh, in, uh, in fact been uh, impacted on the uh, on the erosion of the youth particip participation with uh, with politics, with uh, instruments of governance, uh, with instruments of government, rather? Well, firstly, those institutions are insufficient today because they were declawed by those that still have power. I mean, you talk about leaders like Lindiwe Mazibuko, Mbalin Tuli, Julius Malema. They are all examples of powerful youth leaders who rose up through those ranks, but were systematically uh, chucked out, if you want to use uh, that term, by the established orders of those parties because they were too powerful. It kind of speaks to what you've been saying, right, about, about the youth in, in terms of the platforms that you are afforded to have, right? Literally, young people have to scrape for every second and every minute of people's attention in this country because I think there's become a complacency surrounding you what young people want to talk about. But what we're talking about is important because ultimately the conversations we're having, the important discussions we're trying to facilitate in this country have to do with our lives. It is us who in the next 10 to 15 years will have to buy homes, start families, build our lives. But for as long as South Africa's political system and the structures that be continue to disenfranchise, continue to uh, keep us out, continue to hold up our generation's agenda, you know, Kumo said there were two generations of fees must fall. The third generation will be the one that falls, not the fees, because we haven't had those conversations. And it is as deep as that and it is as painful as that because fundamentally our politics has failed us. You know, we tell young people to vote. Uh, Uba King and Kumo touched on, we said register to vote, register to vote. I was one of those people telling people to register to vote, but never helped people to find who they're going to vote for until later. And that's where So We Vote came in. Ultimately, there's a reason why in a country as desperate as South Africa is right now for a different government, and <laughs> believe me, people are very desperate. There's a reason why the opposition parties aren't already the ones to watch because even they themselves have proven insufficient to the task of assuring the youth of the future, giving us a sense of hope, and giving us a strong sense that they are capable of leading South Africa. And it's not even a thing of the ANC's clout and its history. It's just a thing of, we'd rather take this devil, because we know at least this devil knows how to fly a plane, even if they're crashing into trees, than those guys. And yeah, that's, it is as stark as that. Kumo. I think when I think of uh, uh, universities or higher learning institutions, uh, especially when it comes to politics of today, um, for me, I always think the EFF, right? <coughs> it's managed to to insert its uh, to penetrate all these uh, higher learning institutions, but yet it still doesn't translate to votes. Um, you'll think about 2021, you'll think about 2019, and they were, they were strong then, and they're even stronger now. But seemingly, they are not able to convince that young cohort to go out and vote. What is the problem? What would you say is the reality that they are facing on the ground? So to the EFF specifically, um, if I was to give my own analysis on it, I think it's just that their policies just aren't stomach as bet as well as others um they tend to be on the more extreme side they tend to be very socialist leaning um which isn't something that's been bought into by the world and we've seen what's happened when you try and become a socialist government um and i think even with democracy black backsliding on the entire continent um there's a fear to then put a uh, entity in power that's so pro-socialism when currently the world hasn't responded very positively to that. Um, so in terms of like an actual political analysis, I think it's just that they just sometimes can be a bit too extreme, um, which means that they're not palatable to the majority of South Africans, which makes it very hard to vote for them because you feel like you're voting for the 
far end of it. Um, in terms of getting young people to the polls, and I think why the EFF hasn't necessarily translated results, I just think like university spaces haven't become spaces that cultivate um, student representation, right? I think in engaging with SRC leaders through my podcast, a lot of what the conversations have been has just been that we kind of just vote for our SRC. Everyone kind of says they're going to do the thing that the last SRC said they were going to do, and then that's that. But if you think back to 1980s or the 1990s, where there were student representation organizations, there was conferences, there was a lot more investment into politics mm. at a younger level. Um, and it felt like there was an actual investment of we're trying to better our future and better our politics. I think to that to that extent, that's why I agree with Udata, where he says, look, we need to organize as the youth, because I think we're sitting with major institutions, we're sitting with thousands of individuals, um, yet we're not necessarily having the conversations with them to say, who are we voting for? Who should we be voting for? What necessarily should be the considerations um, but I also think beyond that I think the EFF has also just naturally just hit a ceiling right I think because they got so big so quickly they were kind of grouped in with the same ANC DA um, inefficiencies right because we haven't necessarily seen the EFF govern solely as a government and we haven't necessarily seen their capacity to govern but because they've been part of the conversation and they've been part of the noise at least for the latter 10 years um, a lot of what people are saying is that if you vote for them you're essentially voting for the same part past and there hasn't necessarily been a correlation between what the party officials are saying and how they live and how their uh, how their party actually benefits and i think there's those skepticisms those things that make it impossible for the youth to fully buy into a youth entity like the eff within my personal belief i think really is the anc youth league in terms of just where the population of individuals shifted so yeah uh I want you to perhaps give me an understanding of what the youth, uh, the youth's perception of a coalition government. Uh, many of us have seen what we've all seen what the coalition governments have spelled out in, in Johannesburg in Gauteng uh, metros. What is what is their observation? about what is possibly to come. Are we going to see an instability? Are they worried about that and how it affects them directly? <laughs> the examples of coalitions in this country obviously where a lot of young people would look to as a reference point. And if the references of what we've seen are anything to go by, uh, the overwhelming sentiment, at least from those we've engaged, is on a provincial level, they're not really looking forward to it, but on a national level, depending on who the parties are, they might be interested. So if you speak with the reality of the ANC still retaining, uh, being the biggest party in parliament, but not necessarily the majority party to form a government on their own, you know, there are certain parties there that give them a sense that, okay, we'll still get the ANC, but at least we'll get some people that are better-ish, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say who those people are, uh, but uh, people can assume for themselves. And so, you know, it depends on who the who, who the people are. You know, it's 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 not as simple as we like it or we hate it. It's a sim we we recognize that there's complexity to it, because if we don't recognize the complexity and we just say coalitions, we'll get what's happening in Joburg now with what may are we on now? I don't even know, <laughs> but we'll get that situation. And I mean, you know, speaking to exactly, but I just want to add on what Kuma said exactly. You know, and it speaks to what Utata said because he said here that there were SRC presidents and SRC members who are taking bribes. I just want to say those aren't a proper reflection of young people because the structures of SRCs are built to serve the mother bodies, which are the main party systems. Mm -hmm. And those people will not appoint into SRCs leaders who threaten their rule because I just said they, they already throw them out. So the people who are there that are corrupt are a reflection of this second generation of, I, I call the corrupt people devil spawns. We're seeing the devil spawns coming into SRC leadership. And that's why you're also not seeing on a university level necessarily the power to galvanize and create the youth movements that we saw in the 70s when Steve Biko uh, built uh, Sasko, when, Nas when NUSAS was a movement at the time that young people could get around we are not seeing those types of movements existing today because of that. And so coalitions, mm. SRCs, yeah, don't touch those things. Oh, well, again, um, coalitions uh, have introduced a, a different uh, set of challenges and crises for South Africans. Uh, surely this should be enough for 
to galvanize these young people to go out and vote? I think then that's where also the fear comes in to say, so um, I think it was about last week or two weeks ago, we had a youth summit with young people. And at this youth summit, we invited political parties to come in and join us and engage young people from 48 different communities on what their plans are. It became a squabbling session where we were looking at political parties literally fighting amongst themselves. And when we had a reflection session after that and said, what does this say to you about our country as an undecided voter, someone who's decided to vote, you had a lot of young people who said, this says to me, this is what a coalition would look like. So today we'll wake up with this president, tomorrow with this one, because they couldn't agree on something. And that gives fear to people because that's instability. So you have a lot of people, young and old, who fear going to the voting polls because I might just give this smaller political party a percentage that would allow it to be the kingmaker and go into power but not be able to sustain that power long enough to sustain the country. So that's why then we have a lot of people saying, hey, better the devil you know, uh, will just deal with it as it goes. Because really, our coalitions or the structure of it is not, is not well, we don't have a structure of what a coalition should look like. We don't know what coalition agreements are between parties. It's not something that's out in the open to say once you agree on who the president is or who the mayor is, you stick with that. Because once you change a mayor tomorrow, it affects service delivery in our communities. It affects so many things at a ground <coughs> level. So coalitions, instead of um, inspiring, inspiring hope in people that will have different voices and representatives. People are more on the, will have more fights and people just not getting to agree with one another because we've seen a culture of politics where people are unable to tolerate one another and work together for the betterment of the country. It's about, I just want to be the mayor of the city or I want to be the MMC. I just want power. I don't care about anything else. So that's where the fear of collisions comes from. Uh, but it shouldn't be that way. We're in a democracy and I think the beauty of a democracy is that it gives you so many options. We just need to find ways to manage those options properly and also the role that we play as citizens in ensuring that those coalition work for us, like we've been doing in Johannesburg to say, how do we hold the city accountable for the mess that we find ourselves in? So we need to, to structure it better. Now, my last question to all of you, because we have run out of time. Uh, I, I want to ask, or I can get, or I'm going to start with you, is um, will you vote? If not, why? If, if so, why? Um, so I'm definitely going to vote uh, because I believe in democratic participation. Um, and I do wish that other young people could get to that point where they are able, like Kumo said, to sit down and read manifestos and look at what aligns with you. But besides reading manifestos, which are, could be a repetition of just words on a document, but look at actions of political parties, look at engagements that they have. And I think... Based on what I said earlier about the media, the one important part also that it plays is giving this to us out in play. So you are able to see all of this out in play and you are able to decide based on what you see. So give yourself time and go through that. So I'm definitely going to be making my ex on the 29th and I'm quite excited about that. However, very nervous about what happens after the 29th. I'm very scared to ask the question to, to the gentleman <laughs> next to you. Kuma, will you vote? Um, no, I, look, I've been from the f forefront saying that I will vote. Um, I think just in terms of like what a vote means, the value it holds, the representation it holds, it's very important, right? I just think I was, v I'm very aware of people who feel pressured to vote. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of the youth are finding themselves. I found myself in this instance a few weeks ago and that's why I stopped writing. I looked at all these parties and I said, actually, I don't really know what's going on. Let me go sit back and understand mm -hmm. what political parties are doing and how they look to prioritize me and look to prioritize my beliefs. Um, so uniquely, I think I still want to go vote. I still want to participate. It's my first time voting. So there's also that mm. element of excitement. Um, so <laughs> with all those things, there is lots of excitement. I'm very happy to and very excited to write about where South Africa goes from here, what happens post voting, what does a coalition look like? And I think there's a lot of excitement in South Africa and I think to not participate in that would be a failure on my end. Um, but also it's to say that, look, I still represent the country and I'm still proud to be a South African. And I think some aspect of getting change is getting people to the polls and I stand by that. Uh, I, I, I wish that you guys could participate in terms of contributing to the mailing guardian. I, I think, please, I'm asking you to please contribute to to give us an idea of where the youth is going. Osile, will you vote? I am sitting on <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> uh, no, 
I, I'll definitely be voting, uh, much like Kumu. It's also my first election, and um, 30 years on from democracy, uh, from the advent of democracy, I think that this is an opportunity to maybe try redirect South Africa's current course. I mean, one, it would be hypocritical of me not to vote if I was getting people registered to vote. But on a second level, I think that as a South African who was born in this country will spend his entire life in this country, and when he dies, will be buried here. I have a unique sense of ownership to this nation. And irrespective of how gut-wrenchingly awful the, op the options are in this election, um, I'll be looking to where will I be making my strategic concessions just in the benefit of getting us past this point and into hopefully a much better era of politics. And I think 2029 is really the one to watch for huge change. I think this one, we can see how it's going to play out, guys. Uh, can you share? Oh, uh, well, okay, I look at the Ipsos polling, and if there's anything to go by that, we will still see the ANC as the uh, biggest party in parliament. Um, we'll see the EFF and the DA come very close to each other, and if that's an, any indication, uh, this, uh, what is it? It used to be the moonshot, now it's multi-party. Yeah, I think it will be something else by election day. Uh, we'll, we'll see the MPC fall apart and those parties begin to s scramble to make deals with the ANC because they saw how beneficial it was for the good party. I mean, Patricia DeLille is now a minister. Uh, 2024, we'll see. We'll, we're going to see the same thing. And um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who sells their soul. <laughs> Tata, uh, I'm sure as Gakiso Trust, you are encouraged uh, somewhat by the debate here, the robustness of, of young people and, and them having that uh, willingness to, to share their, um, uh, their own you know, opinions and feelings about where South Africa is going. And not only that, but being wanting to be active in where South Africa is going to shape up to be. Your, your final words and will you be voting? Of course, I, I really am going to be voting. I'm looking forward to the 29th. But I'm much more encouraged today and very happy that, you know, when you were asking that question, I, my heart jumped. And I'm really very excited that uh, all the young people who are here are not opting out. Uh, I think we have a future. So just listening to this debate, we have a future as a country. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panel. That's it from us. Uh, stay tuned.